Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see you today in the house of the Lord. I know we got a little three-day weekend going on right now, so I'm so glad to see you today in the house of the Lord. And uh, I want to just invite all of you to stand with me right now. And we want to link with our West Seattle family right now and share this service together. So I'd love for you just to give a big shout out. My wife is over in West Seattle today. So hey, babe, how you doing over there today? Can you give a big shout out to West Seattle today? We love you. We appreciate you. I know Carrie's been leading worship there. Zach did a great job leading worship over here. It's just a great opportunity, just a wonderful thing for us to be able to share together in God's great mission and what he has for us. I do want to say to all of us before we go to prayer, this weekend when you walk in the door, hopefully you've got one of our little catalogs of life groups. We've got a lot of different life groups going on, both in West Seattle, here in Issaquah. And either campus, you're free to be a part of anything that's going on. You can go to West Seattle. You can come here to Issaquah. There's a lot that's happening. And it's going to be a six-week uh, series that begins on Super Bowl Sunday. So it's not too hard to remember when it begins. And it's going to be a great time. Cheryl and I are going to be making it out to some of the different groups. Can't make it to all of them. Might have to go to Pastor Dan's Taco group though. That sounds pretty good. Sylvan was telling me that he's having a uh, cooking class. I might have to go to that. My wife's always been wanting me to get, become a little bit better at cook. You just never know what God might do in six weeks. Your whole life could change. So I just welcome you today. Be a part. The most important thing is we're going to be talking about vision. We're going to be talking about God's great future for us. And there's just something about being connected in relationship. We're meant to be the body of Christ. We're meant to be encouraging and strengthening to each other. And we don't want anybody feeling like you're journeying through this world alone. But you matter to God and you matter to us. So we welcome you. How about if you just join me in a word of prayer? Would you do that right here and in West Seattle as well? If you feel comfortable, just even feel the freedom just to lift your hands and to just open up your heart. We're going to get into the preaching of the word today. And we just want God to know that we're hungry for him. We're hungry for his relationship. Lord God, I just lift my hands along with your people today. And I thank you for the amazing blessing it is to be able to know you. And I pray, Lord, that as we even speak about it today, for those that may have come today hungry in their heart for change, hungry in their heart to just even know that they could be right with God, that, Lord, today would be their day. And I pray that you would just feed and strengthen every one of us, God, that we would grow deeper and stronger and closer to you. Bless our family, Lord God, in Addis, Ethiopia. Bless our West Seattle family and, Lord, our Issaquah family. And, Lord, even the, the things that you have out in front of us, we lay it all in front of you in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Give somebody a little fist bump. Say good morning. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord. Get ready because God is going to do some great things today. You know, we're in a series that we just started a couple of weeks ago. And our series is about being bold. I don't know if you've ever noticed this about your own personal life, but it's really kind of hard to be bold when you're uncertain. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you're kind of in that phase where you're like, I'm at, you're, you're, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. You know, what happens when you're unsure is you become tentative instead of bold. And today I want to just talk to you about having not a tentative faith, but a bold faith. When you think about the aspects when you really can't see what's next, people are very hesitant. Anybody ever driven down 405 South and you've kind of hit down in Renton, what we call the S-curves? Have you ever noticed it's almost always slow through the S-curves? And there's a reason for it. It's just human nature. When we can't see what's around the corner, everybody kind of slows down just a little bit. And in the midst of life, sometimes we're, we're hesitant about relationships. We're in an era today where fewer and fewer people are being married and they're getting married later in life. And I think one of the reasons for that is that many people have not seen a model of love that can last a lifetime. And so there's an uncertainty about that. Should I even get involved with that? What's the point? Does it make 
make any difference. And we see in so many different areas of our lives that we're being, we're being influenced by where our culture is and we're being influenced by the lack of faith around us. You know, the last few weeks, there was a, a study that's been getting a lot of airtime, at least in, in Christian leadership circles. And it was a survey that took place in the UK. And it was just for adults and they were uh, doing a, th a theological survey of the people. And they were asking them just basic questions of faith and Christianity in particular. Asking such things as, do you believe that there is a Trinity? Is there something that is known as the Father God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And there were a number of different uh, responses. But what was interesting throughout the entire survey, and the reason why it's caught the attention of a lot of Christian leaders, is that in almost every single question that was asked, is the Bible authoritative? Is the message of the physical resurrection of Jesus accurate as it is given in the Bible? Did it really happen? And you have basically three answers. People who say, yes, I believe that. People that say, no, I don't believe that and almost equally divided is now a third category where people say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, is the Bible true? I don't know, did Jesus, was he resurrected from the dead? I don't know about these things. And it was just kind of a real insight because before we had yes or no people. Today we have a whole nother category of people who just say, I don't have a clue. And it's interesting because now there are people that are even shifting how they identify themselves. Well, we know that in a lot of different ways, but they're, they're, they're shifting how they identify. It used to be people would say, well, you know, I'm a believer or I'm, you know, an agnostic. What does that mean? Uh, I, I don't know God. I'm, I don't really know that you can even know God. So I'm, I'm kind of an agnostic about that. I'm, I'm uncertain. I'm, I'm not sure you can really know that. Then there's others who have said, well, I'm an atheist. I, I don't believe there's a God. I just kind of shut that out. Don't really, you know, pay any attention to that. I'm an atheist. I don't believe that. Well, today there's a whole nother group that's rising. And there may be something to this because the Bible even says only a fool says that there's no God. We've talked about this from time to time because who are we to really even give commentary when we have such a limited view of what God has done in all of the universe and all of his creative power? Who are we to say that God doesn't even exist? But now we have a whole nother category that's rising up. And this is the category what people would identify as being um, a apathist. And what that means is, I don't really care. You've heard about atheism. This is apathism. This is, I don't really, it doesn't matter to me. I don't put any time. I don't put any attention. I don't really think about it. I'm not sure that the apathist or the apatheism, as they say today, is really quite exactly the same as the person that says, I don't know. Because it doesn't mean that you don't care. It, that category may mean that someone really hasn't shared with you. You may have grown up in a household where, where people said, I'm an apatheist, where I really don't care. Or you might say, I'm an atheist and I don't believe or all those other things. But you know, it doesn't change what somebody else thinks or what somebody else does doesn't change the fact that you're eternal. Do you know that? It doesn't change the fact that there is a God in heaven and that you've been shaped and created by him and for him and that you have been destined for eternity. And that eternity is either destined to be with God forever or to be without God forever. Now, I just have to say to you today that I don't fall into the category of the apathist because I do care. Do you know that? I care. And I, I believe this. I believe God cares about knowing you. Everything that we know in the scripture teaches us that he's not a God that created and walked away. But he is Emmanuel, God with us. He's the God that cares about you. He's the God that knows you inside and out. He knows you better than you know yourself. So many times we're, we're led down roads where we're being influenced by other people who are telling us, well, you got to do this. Well, you should think this. You, you be, better be careful what you say. You don't want to go down that road. And all the different influences around us. But the truth is every single one of us have been made by God. We've been made for his glory. And God has purpose in our lives. And the most important thing that we could ever learn in your journey of humanity is to honor God with your life. To know that the work of God is that you would know him and you would be known by him. 
that you would work and walk in relationship to God. If you have your Bibles with you today or you have your devices, I want us to take a look into the book of Ephesians. And I want us to take a look at how do we really find this place of a meaningful faith? How do we come to the place where we know that we are, we are important to God, that he cares about us, and he should be important to us, and we should be seekers of God. We should be people moving closer to him. And I'm thankful that you're in church because it says something about you that you're here today, that you are wanting to know God, that you may be on a journey, you may not have faith right now. And uh, that's okay, God has no problem with an open, hungry seeker because he will use that to just pour blessing into your life and, and to just literally reveal his grace and love to you. In the book of Ephesians, the apostle Paul, and he's an interesting person to be used by God to write to us because he was one who stood against Jesus and did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, thought he was a fraud, thought he was somebody leading the people astray until the day God revealed himself to, to Saul. And on the road to Damascus, Saul had an incredible encounter. Three days later, God brought an even greater revelation and he became not only a believer, but God raised him up to be a world changer. And I believe there's many of us here today, you may be in that same journey, coming from the place of unbelief, coming from the place of damaged belief. Maybe you've had bad experiences. Maybe people have hurt you. You can't allow somebody else's failures to rob you of who you are and what God wants to do in your life. Can I get an amen today? How about West Seattle today? You following what I'm saying? God cares about your life. The apostle Paul wrote these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, and I just believe it had to have been an incredible moment for him taking his own personal experience and having the Holy Spirit just bring it forth that even 2,000 years later, you and I could have our lives impacted by these words. Ephesians chapter two, look with me to verse one and follow. Here's what it says. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So basically what the apostle Paul is saying to you and I, all the way back 2000 years ago, they were being influenced by the culture around them. A very sensuous, very immoral culture, a culture where people actually went to temples and they were involved in sexual immorality and it was at all, all a part of their goddess worship and all of these things that supposedly was bringing them closer to the gods. And yet what it was doing was degrading their bodies, ruining their relationships and causing pain in their lives lives. And what the apostle Paul says is at one point you were just dead. You were dead in your transgression. You were dead in your sin. In the time of, of the first century, the word sin was used as an archery term. And when they would shoot an arrow, if it missed anything, if it was off of the, of the bullseye, it was called sin. So what the Bible is saying is anytime you and I are missing what God's purpose for our lives is and what his reality is for our, our relationships and love and morality, when we're missing that mark, that's what God is calling out as sin in our lives. The apostle Paul says, you know, there was a time when you were dead. When you were just literally, you may not have been physically dead, but you were spiritually dead. You were following the ways of the people around you and you were following the ways basically of the enemy himself as the scripture refers to it as um, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's how the Bible describes even the devil himself. He is the influence of darkness in the world today. And the apostle Paul is saying, you were influenced by your own willful sin, the places where you missed the mark and you were following this influence not only of the people around you, but literally of the devil himself who is influencing the way that you would choose to live your life. And he goes on. Verse three, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. So the Apostle Paul is basically saying to us that by your own sinful ways and your own you know, human instincts that live outside of the things of God, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, in these aspects of our lives, as we just go and do what we wanna do, when we wanna do it, with who we wanna do it, where we want, all of these different things, because we're living in disobedience and rebellion to the God that loves us, because of the very nature of our decisions, 
We were objects of God's wrath. Not a very good outlook, is it? To be just in the bullseye of God's wrath. But here's what it goes on. It says this. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8 is so important. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which he prepared in advance for us to do. Boy aren't you glad you came to church today. In this few verses of scripture in Ephesians chapter two, you can get out of a category today that says, I don't know, or you can get out of the category that says, I don't care, and you can get out of the category that says, I don't believe, and you can get lined up with God, and today you can know that you're born again. Today you can know that I am loved of God, he cares for me, he's watched over me, he's made a way for me, God had the perfect perspective of me, he doesn't have a skewed view of who I am. He doesn't gauge me through my family. He doesn't gauge me through my friends. He looks at me one-on-one with me and he looks right into my soul. And God knows that by my own sinful nature, at one time, I should have been the object of his wrath, but that wasn't his plan for me. His plan was to move me into the pathway of faith and to engage me by by the power of his Holy Spirit, take the blinders off of my eye, take the stoppers out of my ear, and awaken my soul, where once I was dead, now I'm alive in Christ. Wow. You can get out of the wrong categories, and today can be your day. Today, you may be a prodigal. In West Seattle, you may be a prodigal. You may be living far from God, and it dogs you because inside your soul, you know the goodness of God. And yet, because of sin, the devil just tries to beat you up and tell you, you know what? You've made so many mistakes. You're so far from God. You're living in rebellion. God can't do anything with you. I want to tell you, that's just an absolute lie of the enemy because God's power is so great when you're spiritually dead, he can track you down and give you heart to heart CPR and bring you from death to life. You don't have to stay where you are today. You may come out of a broken past. You may come out of all kinds of damage. You know, I'm, a, I'm living proof for you today. You know, my mom grew up in a home where her mother and father were alcoholics. She endured a lot of pain, but one day she made a decision. It sounded too good to be true, but your life could be changed because there's a God that loves you. She walked down, people prayed for her. She walked out different. She's never been the same. You can be changed. You can be a world changer. You can be a legacy maker. You can be walking in the things of truth and life. You don't need to be stuck where you are right now. In one moment of faith, that love, that grace, the power of Christ, the one that came out of heaven, the one that came into humanity, lived a sinless life, as Pastor Josh talked about, the one that went to the cross to stand in my place. He took all of my failures. He took my rebellion. He took my own sinful nature, and he destroyed the power of sin sin and death at the cross and on the third day was resurrected from the dead and sits at the right hand of the father today that we can intercede or we can pray and he literally intercedes calling on the father to bring blessing into our lives. Wow, that's the God that we serve. As I was reading about this aspect of of being an apathist and and walking through your life just saying I'm apathetic, I'm apathetic toward God, I'm apatheist, I really don't care. When I was reading about that, one of the guys that was interviewed and was talking about this in the article said, you know, one of the things about even Christians is they seem to be as apathetic as we are. And this individual that was writing this article, he said, I am a Jewish, atheist, homosexual, and my Christian friends don't seem to be too bothered by it. 
and they don't seem to really talk to me about their faith. I know their faith, but they don't talk to me about their faith. So I think that just as I'm apathetic to knowing God, they seem to be equally apathetic about me knowing God. Wow. Where do we fit today? Are we in the category of don't really know, don't really care, don't really care about you, doesn't bother me, you do whatever, you know? I'm not saying we should be intrusive and obnoxious in people's lives, but I think we should be people who share the message of Jesus and what he's done. Jesus gave a great commission. Do you remember that? Matthew chapter 28, when he said, go into all the world, preach the good news. What's the good news? Exactly what we're talking about today. The good news is you may be broken. You may be hurting. You may be trapped in wrong thinking. You may be trapped in wrong things. You may be wrapped in wrong relationships, but you know what? God is bigger than all your wrongs. God is bigger than all your mistakes. God is bigger than all the pain somebody can bring into your life. He's greater, stronger, more beautiful than anything this world can bring to you. Am I, am I preaching truth today? This is the God that we're talking about. Should we be apathetic about our own lives? And should we be apathetic about the Great Commission? Or should we be on mission? Can I get an answer today? What do you think we should be doing? I think we should, we're called to make a difference. We're called to be people who are in the midst of our world. And we're not cramming something down their throat. But you know what? We are making our love known in their lives. We're showing up in places. We're visiting them when they're sick. We're offering a prayer to them in times of need. We're not afraid to say to them, hey, would you mind if I prayed for you? I'll tell you what, I've, I've found in my lifetime where people don't even know I'm a pastor, so don't think that it's all about being a pastor. I've never had a time in my life when somebody was in a deep place of need and I said to them, would you mind if I just even prayed for you? I have never had anybody say, you know, I sure wish you wouldn't. Help me out by not praying for me. I got cancer, do me a favor, don't pray for me. I don't know where my daughter is. She left last week. I don't know where she is. But hey, don't bother praying for me. Never had that. What vibe do you send out to people? Would they say to you, I think that my friends who are Christians, are, they're fine in their club. They're fine with where they go and what they do, but they're pretty apathetic about whether I get there or not. We need to be people of passion. We need to be people on, oh, you guys are really quiet. I bet they're shouting in West Seattle, aren't they? Because we need to be people that are living for the sake of the gospel. You know, your greatest dreams should be lived through the, through the lens of the gospel. Your greatest talents, your greatest dreams, your greatest creativity, it should be lived that you might be able to be used by God. Because you know what? That's what God gives you. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says that in verse 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So what does the Bible say? Once we were dead, but through Christ, we've been made alive. What does it say? It says that we have been saved by faith, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. That God has given us this amazing opportunity of his love and his grace. And all we have to do is open our heart. Listen, get out of the I don't know category. Get out of the I don't believe category. Because, you know, there's something eternal that touches every one of our hearts. You know, we got all the, these sophisticated listening devices and, and we're trying to hear the sounds. And the other day there was a repetition of six sounds and they believe that this came from, you know, all these millions of light years away, that there may be life way out there somewhere because we heard six repetitive sounds. How many times has God spoken to your heart I'm alive, I'm real, I'm powerful. I would, I would venture to say every one of you have had more than six times in your lifetime where you've had an encounter where God witnesses and testifies to himself. How many times have you ever had a wow moment when you looked up into the sky? The Bible says that even the heavens and the earth declare the glories of God. Have you ever had one of those experiences when you saw this amazing sunset coming over Seattle or somewhere else and all you could do is step back and say, wow, isn't this amazing? And it was God whispering in your ear. 
I want to tell you something. Today is the day of the Lord. Today is the day of salvation. Get yourself out of the wrong categories and start moving towards this experience and this experience of, of God's glory and his love, the power of his spirit. The Lord says he'll come into our lives and you don't have to say, I don't know if he's real because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will be your teacher, your guide, your comforter, your counselor. He will lead you into all truth. Jesus said he will take that which is mine and he'll make it known to you. He can impress it upon you. He can tattoo it to your soul that you can see and know the glory of God. You know, there's even more. You got room for more? You ready for more? You're not on overload yet, are you? you? Okay, a little bit more. Here it comes. Verse 10, it says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's workmanship. You know where you get that word workmanship? Comes out of the Greek and what it refers to is we're God's handiwork. You know what that means? You and I are literally the work of his hand. The Bible says that God scooped Adam out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. I want you to know today you are a living creation. You were given by God. You're not a mistake. You're not just a biological fact. You are a creation by a God who loves you and cares for you and put his imprint inside of you that it would be like that which calls the salmon back to the same river. Your soul is called back to the God that made you that you could know him and be known by him. You are God's handiwork. I want you to know that. Some of you think, I'm a a failure. I'm messed up. Can't seem to get out of this. I'm in the category of broken. I'm in the category of of messed up. I'm in the category, I can't seem to get it right. I'm I'm not sure I'm really worthy of somebody's love. I'm not sure somebody should even trust me. I'm not sure I'm worth somebody investing themselves in me. I want you to know there's one who is greater than anybody on this earth who loves you and calls you his own. He doesn't give up on you. He doesn't cast you off. He says, you are what? You're the handiwork of my own hand. What do great artists want to do? They want to identify their work, isn't that right? They want to put the signature on their work. Christ wants his signature on your life. He doesn't want you apathetic. He doesn't want you apathetic about his work in the world. He wants you to be passionate about him. He wants you to be passionate about his work. He wants you to be involved and prayer. Uh, He wants you to be leaning into the kingdom. You want to see amazing things in your life? Then live for the things that are amazing. God's handiwork, God's miracles, God's blessing. You know, West Seattle today, I want you to dream huge dreams. I want you to believe. I want you to to reach. And I want you to see that there is such a thing as when we come and we bring our broken areas and our broken areas of our hearts and our lives and we just yield it and surrender it to God. You know, there's this thing called softening our hearts. And I want you to think about that. When you soften your heart and you, and you get out of that realm that says, I don't believe. I, I'm, I'm an atheist. You know, I was watching this and I saw uh, Bill Maher the other day and this clip of him, he was saying, you know, I'm, I'm making a transition. I'm no longer identifying as an atheist. I'm, a, I'm an apathist. I'm, and I thought, that's a good move. That's a really good move. He's like one more step closer to the kingdom and he doesn't even know that. He's, he's, he's out there portraying that as something that is just so anti-God, so anti-faith, and you, know, you are so ridiculous, you know, to, you know, so far from reason to go with this thing called faith. Let me tell you something. Every day that the sun rises and the sun sets, I'm a little bit smarter by acknowledging the one who made that happen. You know, I'm, I'm not without reason to have the fear of the Lord be the beginning of wisdom and knowledge in my life. That's not without basis or without reason. That's the best thing I could ever do is come to a place of yielding to the one who made me, the one that controls me. You know, I've lived long enough. I don't know about you. Some of you may be too young, but I've lived enough life to figure out there's a lot of things I can't control. I can't control necessarily. <laughs> Can't contr- Honey, how you doing in West Seattle? <laughs> I, can't, I can't control my kids. I can't control situations. I can't even sometimes control my own thoughts. Anybody here? But there's a God who in the midst of all these things never quits, never gives up, loves, is full of compassion and mercy. And you know what? He wants, to, he wants me to soften my heart. Because when I soften my heart, 
It's like a fresh lump of clay put on the potter's wheel. And he can mold me and make me. And you know what? He can be, make something beautiful out of things that aren't so good right now. Isn't it amazing that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose? It doesn't say all things work out for good for those who are apathist. You want to be an apathist? God will let you go in your own ability and see how well it works out for you. You want to be an atheist? Declare there is no God? You know what? God doesn't force salvation on anyone. He offers it graciously, free from the love of his heart to you. But if you want to reject it, that's why we don't have to legislate everything in our culture. It's because the Lord gives freedom of choice, freedom of will. And if, if you choose, listen, re realize this. God doesn't have to send people to hell. People choose their path away from God and God will let you go your way or God will open the gates of heaven and receive any soul, any heart that wants to be right. Jesus was hanging on a cross. Why was he even on that cross? Because he came to stand in the place of the sinful that they might be able to walk into the eternal. And when there was a man on the cross who was a thief and deserved to die for his behavior, he looked over at Jesus and he said, when you enter your paradise, remember me. And Jesus looked over at him the first guy to receive the whole reason for him coming was the man that was on the cross. And Jesus said, believe me, today you will be in paradise. So today, don't discount what God could do with you. Don't discount what redemption, forgiveness, new life. Soften your heart. Give, give God all the things that are messed up, addicted, maybe even successful. Sometimes there's people that are so driven by success that it overwhelms what real life is all about. And it could be you're more successful than is healthy. Does that just sound strange? But it's true. Sometimes you're just driven, 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 driven into a place of oblivion instead of being yielded, yielded, yielded to where God can move and God can make you bold. Instead of not being able to see through the S-curves and you slow down and you're like driving through the fog and you're, not, you're uncertain about what's happening, you're uncertain, can I trust this? I'm uncertain, should I believe this? All of a sudden, if you put, if you put your faith in Christ, Christ is gonna give you the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the best thing you could ever, it's better than fog lamps, it's better than GPS. He knows what's out there ahead of you. He knows what you, he can say, this is the way of the Lord. He can say, you know what, you need to move over here a little bit. He can give you discernment about relationships. He can give you discernment about business decisions. He can teach you how to raise your kids. He can tell you when it's time to be a little stronger and time to be a little softer. And how many know that's the most amazing thing? And then God, you know what he does? He puts his stamp on you and people look at you and they see you. You know what they say about you? They don't say that you're apathetic. They don't say that you are godless. You know what they say? You know what? That's an amazing person. That's a, person of, that, that's a person of grace, or that's a person who, man, I, I, I love that person. I love them. You know why people say that? Oh, I love them. You know why? Because they're the kind of people you wanna walk in the room when you have a problem, because they're not gonna reject you. They're gonna soothe the pain in your life. They're gonna speak wisdom into your life, and you're gonna walk out of that place going, wow, you're fed by just being around them. That's what a Christian life with the signature of Jesus on you, that's the outcome. Is anybody here know what I'm talking about? There's that loving, gracious, powerful life that the Lord wants every one of us to have. You are the handiwork of God. You know, when people look at you, you need to realize this. You can be a trophy of God's grace. You know, I, I've seen people in life and they have been hurting. They've been messed up. And then, you know, you see them somewhere down the road and their life is totally different. And it's amazing the percentage of those people that have a testimony that says, you know, there was a day when I came to Christ and Christ turned my life around. It is absolutely stunning. Is there anybody that has that witness in this room today? Anybody know what I'm talking about? The power of a life that is changed by the grace of God. 
in an instant, in a moment of faith, it begins. It is the spark of God's love into your soul. Today, this is, this is, this is, important, this is important stuff. The most important thing that could ever happen in your life for fulfillment, for success, for wholeness, but more importantly, to just simply be right with the God who loves you is to have a life that's yielded to God, a life that says, Lord, come, speak to me. Lord, speak to me. God, I give you my life. I give you my heart. I'll tell you what, you will never be disappointed that you gave your heart to God. Would you bow your heads with me today, both here and in West Seattle? I want to call you to this moment of just living faith. You are the handiwork of God. Would you give him some clay to work with? Today, would you just lay down the things that are broken and fractured? You know, some of you may say, I don't know if God could do anything with me. You know what? Michelangelo didn't paint the Sistine Chapel in a day, a week, a month, a year. It's from 1508 to 1512. But today, nobody talks about how long it took. They just talk about how beautiful it is. There's an architect that has passed on, but his name is Antonio Gotti. And he was the architect of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. People come from all over the world to see this great cathedral, still under construction. In 2026 will be the 100th anniversary of him working on this cathedral. And every part of that cathedral has a purpose and it has a reflection of Gaudi's view of God. You know what God does in our lives? He puts his signature on you and he's patient with you like any great artist would be because he wants his signature to be upon your life, that you're a person who's been changed by the grace of the Lord. You're a person that's been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. You're a person that has stepped from spiritual death into spiritual life, and your heart is right with God. Today, just giving me 60 seconds of personal reflection all over this building, all over in our, in our West Seattle campus as well. As you just consider this today, are you right with God? Are you, are you living as somebody who really knows the Lord? Or are you apathetic in your soul? Do you know the truths of God, but you're not living as if you know them? Are you allowing God to put his mark upon your life, your, your choices, your decisions, your relationships, the very core of who you are? Does it have the mark of Jesus? Today, I call you to put your faith in God. I call you today to step out in faith and to get out of the broken places, get out of the places where the wrath of God awaits and come into that place where the power of God's love and his mercy can take root right here, right now inside of your heart. If that's you this morning, and you just want to get your heart right with God here in West Seattle, I'm going to ask you, would you do something just between you and me and God? Would you take a bold step today? Would you step out of the fog, out of the S-curves and make a decision? God, I believe that Jesus is real. I may not know everything there is to know about it, but I want to know it. I'm not apathetic. I'm not agnostic. I'm not atheistic. I'm not an apathist. But Lord, I want to be born again. I want to be a Christ follower. I want to be right with God. If that's you today, would you just lift a hand? I want to pray for you today, right here, that you could walk out of this room today with things settled in your soul. I see a lot of hands going up. How about yours? They would just say, God, I just need to get some things right. I just want to know my heart is right with you. Amen. See some men raising your hands. Thank you, gentlemen. See some ladies, even all the way to the very back. Thank you for that step of faith. Thank you for that. Anyone else right now that would just lift a hand, symbolic of your soul, you know, you may feel like, wow, I don't know. There's just such a battle going on. I see some young people raising your hands. Thank you for that as well. You know, today there's a battle for your soul. You need to know this. There's a battle that got you where you are. There's a battle trying to harden your heart, trying to make you just, you know, lock your heels down and just live in this place of unbelief. And I'm just telling you, when you stand before God someday, you're not gonna wanna have, you're not gonna wanna have that on your resume. You're not gonna wanna have that hanging over you that you chose to willfully reject. Because I'm, I'm telling you this, you came to church today and your pastor preached the truth to you. So you can never say, God, I 
I stand before you today and nobody ever told me about Jesus. Nobody ever told me about salvation. Nobody ever told me I was dead in my transgression, but I could be made alive in Christ. You can no longer stay in that category because you and me and God are aware of what happened here today. Anybody else that would just say, Lord, I soften my heart. I just soften my heart and I ask you to come in and do a work inside of me. God, you may need to throw the clay down and start on the wheel. You may need to get a, a sanding belt out and take off some rough edges. God, you may need to get a hammer and a chisel and just knock out some stuff that doesn't belong in me. But God, put your signature on my soul. Anybody else today, this is your day, you know it. You sit there right now and you know it that God is speaking to anybody else that would just lift a hand and say, God, that's me. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Lord, this is my day. Thank you, sir. This is my day. This is my time. Amen. Would you stand with me all over this building? There's victory in this house today. Can you sense it? Can you feel it? There's, there's people coming to the Lord today. People coming to the Lord. Can I say this? We are not apathetic about that. We are not neutral about that. This is our passion. And I wanna tell you something else. I'm asking our prayer team and our, our pastors to come forward. And I want you to know something about faith, real faith. There's no shame in real faith. When you make a decision to follow God, the angels in heaven, the Bible says, rejoices over every person that comes to the Lord. And you know what? We rejoice too. And there's no arrogance and there's no pride in this house because there's nobody that could stand before God and have their total heart bared before men and be without sin or mistakes. So when God calls you to a place of liberty and freedom in your life, you gotta know in this church, there's nothing but a family that says, wow, thank God for what's happening in your heart. It's the greatest thing that happened to me and I am so thankful that it's happening for you. Amen. So I'm going to pray for you today. And those of you who raised your hands, whether it's the first time or a place of reconnection, I'd love for you just to come and, and joyfully just let somebody pray for you. They're, they're trained to, to minister to you in just two minutes. So it's not going to hold you back today, but it will propel you forward. Would you pray with me right now? And all over this house, let's pray this prayer to open our hearts, soften our heart to God. Lord, I lift my heart to you today. Just say it to the Lord in your own way. God, I sense your presence in this house and I sense you speaking to me. And Lord, I just pray that today you would forgive me of my sin, that God, you would just cleanse me. I pray, Lord, as I give you my life, I just hand you where I'm at and I hand you every aspect of my life inside and out. And I pray that you'll just throw my heart, my life as clay onto your potter's wheel. And I pray that today you'd begin to mold me and begin to shape me into your handiwork, into your craftsmanship. And Lord, that you would make a treasure and a masterpiece out of the broken things of my life. I come, Lord God, humbly today to get out of the category of arrogance that says there is no God or I really don't care if there is to a place of humility that says, God, thank you for loving me. And I ask you to come and begin to speak to me, make yourself known in me. And God, I pray that today you'll bless every one of these hearts, that today would be the beginning of an amazing new life of following Jesus. And Lord, I also pray in this, in this church right now that you would capture the attention of your people. I pray for every person who professes Christ that no longer would we live apathetic ourselves, no longer would we be apathetic about our morals and our values and our obedience to the will of God. But I pray for a fresh fire. Would somebody burn and somebody pray with me today? Lord, let the fire burn fresh in our hearts. Let a, let a kingdom mindset come upon us. Lord God, may we really truly live like we believe that you are the God. May our neighbors and our friends not look at us and say, wow, yeah, they're Christians, but boy, they're apathetic about whether I come to know the same thing. Lord, let them know that we're loving, we're gracious, we're compassionate, and we're passionate about them because they matter to you and they matter to us. I pray the blessing of God upon our church here and in West Seattle. 
I want to speak to you in West Seattle for just a moment today as Pastor Craig comes to the altar. I want to ask you as I pray a prayer and as I close this prayer, I don't want there to be any gap between my prayer and you responding. I'm going to ask you just to step out and come forward today and just solidify what God's doing in your heart as you're making this decision to follow Christ. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I just pray over our West Seattle family. I pray for those you're touching right now that you give a spirit of faith right now, Lord God, just to lay everything else aside, to come forward and to believe and to be changed. And I pray that for our Issaquah family as we ask this together in Jesus' name, amen and amen.